Hello everyone! In Cambrian Explosion Part 1, we saw that various phyla of animals were already diversifying long before the Cambrian began, and that the genetics underpinning animal development had been invented during the late Precambrian. Now, we turn to what actually happened in the Cambrian. <laughs> The last video ended by posing the question of how animals came to dominate aquatic ecosystems, since the unusual fauna, known as Ediacaran biota, including Charnia, Ediacaria, Cyclomedusa, etc., were already large, well, relatively speaking, some being as big as a bath mat, and in charge, literally, for tens of millions of years. But that Ediacaran ecosystem eventually crashed, one of those mass extinction things, and over an apparently shorter time span, maybe just a few million years, it seems that recognizable animal phyla were everywhere, completely phasing out the earlier Ediacarans. It's important to stress that this transition wasn't overnight, no evolutionary transition is. Remember that the Cambrian began about 542 million years ago and ended about 485 million years ago. That's 57 million years of geologic and evolutionary history just for the Cambrian side of it. During this long period, life went from a largely uniform and two-dimensional ecology dominated by microbial mats covering the seafloor to a very heterogeneous and three-dimensional one, supported by a complex food web. So what happened? The fact is that no one knows for sure what caused the Cambrian explosion, but a number of hypotheses have been proposed and they likely work together. One such was that a steep increase in oxygen triggered significant evolutionary changes. Another is the hypothesis that the formation of eyes triggered the Cambrian explosion. In the kingdom of the formerly eyeless, even blurry vision can enable a predator to hunt down lunch, or the lunch better evade the oncoming predator. What we must understand is that there is very likely no single cause of the Cambrian explosion. But just as in other macroevolutionary transitions, it was more plausibly a result of numerous interlocking parts. Consider that oxygen hypothesis detailed in the 2013 paper, Oxygen Ecology and the Cambrian Radiation of Animals. The authors proposed that increases in oxygen caused increased predation, which triggered an arms race. Since aerobic respiration provides much more energy than anaerobic respiration, the organisms had the ability to expend much more energy on food gathering. This arms race spurred the building of exoskeletons, particularly among the trilobites, which then became preserved in the fossil record, which is how paleontologists marked that a Cambrian explosion was underway. Perhaps the increase in oxygen wasn't a sharp increase, but small increases punctuated by low oxic periods. Perhaps only one short-lived oxygenation event was needed of a certain magnitude to trigger the growth of predators that, in turn, drove an arms race. It could have played out in many ways, but a 2009 paper, Self-Recognition and Calcium-Dependent Carbohydrate-Carbohydrate Cell Adhesion Provide Clues to the Cambrian Explosion, suggests how a surge of oceanic calcium might have allowed animals to build on their evolving cellular systems to make those exoskeletons which got them preserved for us to wonder about half a billion years later. But, modern animal phyla also pushed out the Ediacarans. Some authors propose that since many Ediacarans were soft-bodied, they were outcompeted by the new hard-bodied bilaterians and driven to extinction, as documented by the 2015 paper, Biotic Replacement and Mass Extinction of the Ediacara Biota. Other authors propose that the burrowing behavior of bilaterians destroyed the cyanobacterial mats that Ediacarans were associated with, putting them on the extinction slide. Burrowing also leads to bioturbation, the mixing of soil which makes nutrients available to a wide variety of organisms, not just the burrowers themselves. Bioturbation is an important driver of biodiversity in many current ecosystems, including terrestrial ones. So it is not far-fetched to propose that this was at least one important factor driving the Cambrian explosion. And, finally, some authors propose that some Ediacarans actually survived into the early Cambrian, long enough at least to provide sources of organic carbon to the bilaterians that allowed them to thrive and diversify, which is documented by the 2015 paper, 
the origin of the animals, and a savanna hypothesis for early bilaterian evolution. The takeaway here is that there's no need for some central and all-encompassing explanation that definitively explains the extinction of Ediacarans and the diversification of bilaterians. While a lot of this critical evidence may always remain lost to science, rocks erode and not all animals get fossilized, what we do understand is that both events did occur, and after passing into the Cambrian, many bilaterian body plans became exposed to the world. Suddenly, in geologic terms, many new groups of animals appeared, and we're seeing the clues on the intervening processes all around. For example, crossing the boundary from the Precambrian to Cambrian is an informal group of animals called the small shelly fauna, including brachiopods, archaeocyathids, mollusks, echinoderms, and some onica foreign-like creatures that might even be the ancestors of arthropods, and many other enigmatic species. That's a lot of life in the zone between the old Ediacaran realm and the replacement Cambrian ecosystem, which didn't stop diversifying. Remember from the last video that Camborella is regarded as a Lophotrochozoan, the clade encompassing rotifers, flatworms, annelids, and mollusks. Other Cambrian members include Wawaxia and Orthrozanclus, both of which look quite different from modern Lophotrochozoans. Many other clades of protostomes are similarly represented in the Cambrian. There are preapulid worms, such as Atoya, remnants of tardigrades from the Burgess Shale, and a number of protostomes around the split between velvet worms and arthropods, such as Hallucigenia and Diania. The arthropods and their relatives themselves underwent a massive radiation as well. Opabinia was a five-eyed, legless creature with a long proboscis that ended with pinchers. Anomalocaris was a member of a well-known group of predatory, arthropod-like creatures with grasping mouthparts. Nariocaris has been regarded as the most basal arthropod. Remember, we mentioned Eglaspedida, Fushianheia, and Yawunik back in Scorpion Evolution. Closely related to Fushianheia is the recently discovered Chengzhengacaris. And, of course, no discussion of Cambrian arthropods would be complete without a mention of everyone's favorite arachnomorph, the trilobite. Trilobites are closely related to chelicerates and are represented by over 20,000 species. That's comparable to us mammals. Some were over a foot long, while others were less than a millimeter. Some had large spines, while others were smooth. Some had large compound eyes, while other deep-sea-dwelling species were totally blind. In short, trilobites explored a wide array of different morphologies between the start of the Cambrian and the end of the Permian, a quarter of a billion years ago, when they were completely wiped out in the mass extinction. What about the deuterostome side of Bilateria? Well, they underwent their own series of radiations, some of which we met back in Common Ancestry Part 3. Saccharitis is classified as a basal deuterostome, existing right at the start of the Cambrian. The Vetulocystids were a group closely related to echinoderms that lived out a sessil, filter-feeding life on the sea floor. The Vetulocolians were protochordates with no armor or predatory appendages of any sort. Thus, they were assumed to have been planktivores which means there would have been some plankton for them to eat, yet more tiny pieces missing from the flickering Cambrian movie trailer. Don't get the Vetulocystids and Vetulicolians mixed up. Once we do get to the chordates, though, the forms get more familiar to us. Receiving a lot of attention due in part to Stephen Jay Gould's book Wonderful Life, Pekaya is a compressed, worm-like animal related to the modern lancelet, a cephalochordate known from the Middle Cambrian, and one of its important features is the beginnings of development of what eventually becomes the vertebrate head. Cathay Myris is another Middle Cambrian cephalochordate. Some of its features are seen in the later Zongzaniscus, which is considered transitional between the cephalochordates and later forms like Malaconmingia. Hykuella is closely related to the tunicates, the Eurochordates, and finally the first true fish appear at the tail end of the Cambrian, such as Teraspidomorphi. You can see these early jawless fish were still a long way from salmon. And so we end the Cambrian explosion, but before we go we must turn briefly to the period following the Cambrian, the Ordovician. While people tend to think that the Cambrian explosion was a huge expansion of life, the Ordovician radiation actually outdid the Cambrian, tripling the biodiversity that the Cambrian produced. And the phylum Bryozoa, which are aquatic filter-feeding Lophotrochozoans, didn't even appear for sure until the Ordovician, 
in which case not all phyla were present during the Cambrian after all. We've seen from this and the last video that the Cambrian explosion wasn't the beginning of life or all animal phyla. Animals and numerous other organisms were thriving long before the Cambrian occurred. However, the Cambrian did give us a peek into one intriguing slice of the ancient world. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.